1977 was my first trip to see the Matterhorn. So that, if you look in the reflection of my glasses, if you get a high enough res, it's the Matterhorn. And I did climb it, so. Um, but it was something I saw early on in my, you know, as a 17-year-old punk that worked dishwasher and all sorts of hours and two bucks an hour and saved money and went on a backpacking trip through Europe uh, in 1977 and saw the Matterhorn and said, that's awesome. And you, and have, the, you have the same shoes since 1977? No, but I do have those old shades. My <laughs> one daughter found them once. They're a little bit tight. Yeah, these are better. <laughs> yeah, because the, the reason you do it is because of the glare. You get, you'll get blind from <coughs> too much reflection on the snow. Um, and they look awesome. No. <laughs> it's all about vanity. But um, so you guys, it sounds like you're doing the harder work that I <coughs> specifically not to do. That is try to scale agile in large, gigantic organizations. So that is tough. Um, and there's a lot of amazing things out there. So I'm really glad someone's taking it on. And I, I, I don't envy you. And it's, you know, one, one of my, um, sort of techniques is often to sidestep giant bureaucratic organizations. Like like Mac, Mac, I just don't do well with bureaucracy. I don't, even when I did work in a larger defense contractor company and the admin, administrator was coming by to check timesheets, I'd like go in the bathroom, <laughs> literally. <laughs> like, oh crap, it's not filled out. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, yeah, I don't do well. Anyway, so who, who here, is whoops. Who here is really happy and like on a killer awesome agile team? <laughs> nice. A little bit. Okay. Nice. How about uh, is on a mediocre trying to be agile team that wants to do better? Oh, yeah, it's more. Of a, how about who's here is on like a horror show team? <laughs> uh, like you want to blow your brains out or put duct tape on? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, one of the things I'd like to try to, th this is for you, so I, I mean you can interrupt, you can forget the red card, I mean it's too late if you throw a red card at the end of the, of the basket on me, so throw, throw the red card now or throw the green card, like, yeah this is really awesome, yeah keep talking about that. So this is really for you, I'm, I have some, obviously some slides, but feel free to interrupt because this isn't about following a plan as much as it is about adapting to what intrigues you all. So I think it's important to, to know that in, in some sense, I think Agile is misunderstood. It's not a silver bullet. It's not, I mean, you might not know it, but the reason that there was the gathering in Snowbird ahead of time was we were a bunch of lightweight, non-rational, unified process methodologies, right? So there was a lot of heavyweight process. Mill standard, 2167, 497. What, I had to do some DOD contract, and I remember the first time I saw something, he was like, all right, what idiot would try to follow this? <laughs> like, this is just, I want to get my job done. I don't want to do all this. You know, it was like this massive spec about how to do software development for the government. And I was doing DOD research and development, so um, flight simulation, all sorts of crazy stuff. In, in my estimation, trying to follow that sort of bureaucratic standards just seemed like a waste of my money, because I'm a taxpayer too. <coughs> it's easy to spend other people's money, but I actually don't like spending other people's money. So I, I was a, one, a member of a lightweight process movement, feature-driven development, <coughs> luckily, because I, I had a mentor called Peter Code. He was my object-oriented mentor for years. Um, and there were uh, the others that you know, the Alistair Coburns, the Ron Jeffries, the XP movement, right? We did invite Brady Booch from IBM, Rational Unified Process. So we, you know, we invited them, they didn't, they didn't come. But the idea was there's something that a lot of us are doing that's not as heavyweight as some other processes. So what about these different processes are similar? You know, what, what, what kind of commonalities might we find? So you know, we really went there truly as a 
a, a way to get together. We actually called ourselves initially lightweight methodology until we were about to have a meeting. Should we go to, uh, should we go skiing or should we go to the Anguilla? You know, like in the, in the islands, right? That was a decision. And then we, then we started to become like, what do we want to call this little gathering? And someone said, oh, the lightweight, me and Al Alistair Coburn says, I don't think I want to be known as a lightweight anything. Because <laughs> at least in the American culture, a lightweight is <coughs> you can't drink, you get sand kicked in your face, you're a little weakling, you're a, so it's like, oh yeah, lightweight, that's not so good. My memory isn't too good. I happened to be doing agile fighter research at the time. I don't remember if that's exactly where agile came from, or someone else thought of the word agile, and I said, yeah, because an agile fighter versus a big lumbering bomber, or a small speedboat versus a big carrier, right? I mean, it was that concept of, of we're trying to, to say that there's there's better ways to do a process to achieve the same end goal than this giant, hard to turn, huge, you know, humongous process. So that's really what, what, what we set about to do, is to really find out you know, what kinds of things do we all agree on. About me, I'm not a software guy, right? I, I think I had Fortran, like two courses in school at Ohio State. Good luck, guys. Um, so I'm not, I don't know if you guys are all comp side or whatever, I'm not, I'm not one of those. I am, however, an engineer that likes to solve problems and likes to use things to solve problems. So to me, software was an awesome tool. It wasn't the end, it was a means to an end. And um, so I kind of got bit by the software bug as a young engineer testing cruise missile engines. And then morphed into real-time flight simulation, putting putting F-14 pies through flat spin. Remember Top Gun, where Deuce got killed because it was a flat spin? Where at the time, we were doing a lot of research, and we actually had a centrifuge in Warminster, Pennsylvania. 50-foot arm, it could do 15 Gs per second. It could, you know, it could really smack your ass with really hardcore Gs, and we put people through flat spins, which is negative six Gs this way, eyeballs out. Taught them how to get out of it. And that was through awesome software that we use in real-time flight simulation. So I cut my teeth in doing software on things like that. And um, you know, really, you know, that's, that's where I got totally passionate about how, how awesome software is at solving problems and helping, helping do things. So um, built a few companies together. Software's one of them. We sold it to Borland, who probably trashed it, I guess. <laughs> I, I didn't go work for them because they seemed a little daffy. <laughs> yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> Um, and yeah, like I said, uh, I was I feel fortunate to have been at Snowbird. It was really quite an honor to, to be amongst those, those other folks. Um, one of my big passions about that day, two days, other than Martin Fowler can't ski, um, <laughs> was coming from the DOD world, I felt a lot of the process and planning was all, I don't want to say dishonest, because we're up, but it was like, I don't know, we're 80% done with this task. All these tasks. Like either the feature's complete and I can use it or it's not, right? There's no 80% done. And there was this, just this weird, you know, struggle in my mind with doing typical project planning on software. And it just seemed like, so one of, I remember Martin Fowler had us throw cards and I write big things. You know, we had different techniques that to try to pull from us our ideas, and a couple of them that I had were honesty and just being, you know, really clear about the progress you have through a given <coughs> project. You can't be 80% done for like nine months. That just right, that doesn't work. <laughs> so you know, there was a lot of a lot of interesting ways where we try to tease out and turn it into. Imagine how hard it is to turn a bunch of fairly opinionated people down into four bullets. You know, it's, that's not easy. Um, so I, I find it you know, really, really a blessing to have been there. And then there's lots of other stuff right now. Enough about me. Oh. <laughs> I think you hit the play button, I think. There. there you go. I need to draw those symbols back on there. <laughs> yeah. You, well, you just need one button. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. This is the idiot button. Uh -huh. Yeah, press this, <laughs> dumbass. Um, It'll do something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 
hopefully the right thing, and never the wrong thing. Can't go backwards, can only go forwards. Um, all right, well, that's it. Any questions? No, just kidding. <laughs> so that's yeah, just a joke. But really, you know, how agile do you consider yourself and your team? I went to Polo Match, this is pretty cool. They're, it's amazing to see an animal of that size and speed make a turn like that in the wall. But um, if you think about it, how agile would you consider yourselves? And he, what does that even mean? Is there some scale? Is there some measure? I don't know. It's a good question. No answer, sorry. How about any of you working on a really high performing team? I've done that a couple times in my life. TogetherSoft was one. Um, the development team I uh, worked with in Russia, amazing. I've only worked with a couple high, I'm trying to grow a high performing team where I'm working at right now. A um, bunch of young Turks and really trying to steep them in how to be kick ass. But it's really rare. I, I, I don't know, has anyone ever worked on a really killer high performing, right? I mean, it's, it's enjoy the ride. Yeah, right? It's not easy, but it's fun. And the other funny thing is, how do you know it was peak? Right, that's the other goofy thing about what we do. We're not bricklayers. Hey, I can lay 20 bricks a minute. Oh, wow, really, my team can only do 10, huh? I can write 60 features an hour for a month, or, right? I mean, we, we unfortunately have really lousy ways to measure ourselves. But when you're on one of those high performing teams, it's something special. And it's not easy to be there. Do your team struggle with rather mediocre performance? Yeah, it's a job. Right. That happens. Can anybody have any stories or anecdotes? Maybe <coughs> protected with, without saying any names. Any, any particular things that you struggle with? With doing parts of Agile or the team's not doing well? Yes, I sir. think the biggest thing is between the design and the software coding, right? Ah. Design versus coding. So design has to be way in lead of coding. That always becomes an issue for the feature. So he says there's a, often a, a gap between the design and the coding. So that is a really good, a good point. Anybody here hear of emergent design or emergent architecture? I don't know what that is. I'm not good enough for that. But, um, but I, I like to. Um, does anybody have have a similar experience with the different sort of like going from design to coding? And and what are some of the bad symptoms? Is it just stuff starts getting shoved onto the stack that's not very well thought out, or? Uh, the or design team doesn't have enough time when the feature comes into the sprint. The design team doesn't have enough time to really get a good handle on it to get it vetted. But how do you separate the design team from the development team? I'm very confused. You said the design team doesn't have. What are they? Is Adler part of the development team? Yeah, but as a scrum team, if there are designers on the team, they always feel that, okay, I don't get enough time to really think okay. about So, and when you talk about design team, and one of the gentlemen pointed out, why is there even a quote design team design versus team. development team? Now, you, do you mean architecture design, or do you mean UI design? UI, both UI design. Yeah. <coughs> it's, you know, it goes back to a feature is not real until it's like through the, you know, thin vertical slice through the whole stack, right? You can't just do all the UI. Or, hey, I've got this really awesome killer, you know, third world <coughs> form database designer. I haven't used SQL in years because I've fallen in love with Mongo. But um, the, the UI design, that's not uncommon. My, I don't know if you want any of my opinions. <coughs> the way I solve that is you do enough. Like, I'm going to put this in the context of a typical <coughs> application where UI might not be uh, like Steve Jobs awesome, but just a regular UI. Now, uh, I admit if there's some real potential that the UI could be the killer feature, okay, that's a different story. Are you, I don't know if you're talking about that. Because if that's not enough time, that, you know, that's a really complex project when a killer UI could really make or break a, a company. That, that deserves a lot of UX, a lot of, you know, all sorts of ways to get feedback.
but a typical session to add a new feature, to put some design love into it, I run into that all the time, where I want to build this feature, I got rough ideas, we sketch them, but I can actually get the, the team, the development team, working ahead of time. Some of the folks are a little better than others at the UI, maybe they contribute a little bit, but my, my bottom line is the functionality, and there's lots of, like Max said, there's no one size fits all. I can probably contradict myself, but <clears throat> I will build and understand the problem domain first maybe from bits of, of ideas from the UI, bits of ideas from the requirement, but to me the problem domain is what's really key. That's what's making us money, is understanding the business that the UI needs to express. So sometimes I'll start with a really simple, trivial UI that gets a job done, right? And make sure we can go do X, Y, and Z, and here's what the model looks like, start building the features, you know, write some cucumber specs, make sure we understand what, the, what it should do. We can pretty it up, and, and, you know, Maybe by the time you get something up and running, we can keep working on the UI, pretty it up, and bring in some of the specialists. So in general, I try to try to keep the ball rolling um, and not have it quite so um, waterfallish. So to your point, there are about you know like two teams. Yeah, sometimes I got specialists because some people are way better, especially UI. Um, you know, I got an awesome young kid in Tennessee working on a UI now. I wasn't sure what less meant. If you do CSS, and I, I don't think that was that. I'm pretty sure it wasn't. But I don't know if that, if that answers, but that's how I do it. Right? I don't wait. I hate wait. I hate even having to integrate with somebody else. I can't stand being blocked. That just kills me. Even if it's my own team on the other side of, the, of a hall that is doing this other legacy app, and I need something integrated. Luckily, I got one of my young Turks now able to write code in, in their code. Woohoo! I'm not blocked. <laughs> I can do my own code. I hate not being able to move forward. And also, the, the thing, you know, one of the things that Peter Code taught Mac and I, you know, design by interface, really break things apart, componentize. You know, under if you understand that that there's a plug here somewhere, there's probably a three prong plug, right? If you understand that, all right, we're we're going to talk through this plug. And this is the three problem. You gotta, you gotta work through this. Then both sides can go off and build. And that's something I learned as an engineer, breaking down the cruise missile fuel control system. Right? Their interfaces are real. They're like plus or minus five volts or pressure. You know, that's a real interface. Or the inlet to the, you know. Anyway. So that was a good one. I hope. So what kind of, if you think about it, what kind of grade would your stakeholders give your team? How close are you, are you to your stakeholders? Do you have ones that work right with you? Like, yeah, we're lucky that we have. That's a good, that's a good way to put it. And the government contract and the yeah. product owner shows up three, four times a week here at site. So we're yeah, lucky. a product owner showing up three or four times a week, that is good. And you're, uh, you're probably right to say lucky. Does anyone else feel that's lucky? Yeah. Yeah. We got our product owner. In the team room with us. In the team room, that's yeah, even yeah. better. You well, throw stuff at him or her. Until we started having too many pivots. Mm -hmm. Ah, too many pivots. Oh, but that's agile. All right, we're supposed to be agile. Yeah. Come on. What do you mean you can't pivot? Of course, then you never deliver anything. Right? <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's hard. Well, we're just getting paid by the hour, I guess. We'll just keep working. Today's pivot from yesterday's pivot from the day before. Yeah, if you wait long enough and ignore some, maybe it'll come back around. Right? That's another strategy. <laughs> and how would you guys, you know, grade yourself? That's that's not easy either. I'd like to take that seven things to retrospective or whatever, because I could probably use some tips. Does anybody here do retrospectives? Anyone here do them frequently? All right, man, you're way better than me. Yeah, that's good. You learn a lot. Sometimes. Sometimes? So you need a retro on a retro. So I think you know some of the elements behind the agile movement were taken to extreme. Some of them are um, you know when you, there's it, I don't know why we in the software love these Japanese martial arts terms. I don't get it. But the Shu Ha Ri thing. Right, it's okay to be in shoe and follow something. 
not like the shoes you walk, but the SHU shoe, um, right? That's one way to learn. Oh, these Agile guys, they said to do this, okay. And you do it for a while, and then hopefully you make your own decision. Because Ron Jeffries and I will often debate this. I say Agile's hard, he says Agile's easy. Well, in some sense, we're, well, in some sense he's right, I think I'm right. Agile is easy, but it's actually hard because you have to think all the time. What's easy is following a road process. That's easy. Right. Right? Anybody can do that. Just like a complex design. Anybody can build a complex system. That's easy. I used to love walking down hallways of when I used to be in a barn store or walking, going around a different country. You'd see like the, the big, uh, I don't know where they get the plotter paper, but these giant graphs, plots of giant database designs. You know, it'd be like a, you know, <laughs> 10 feet of tables. But small, like, I don't know if I could read it now. Right? Yeah. And I'm really glad I grew up poor and, and only had a small printer so that all of my models, if, if they started to not fit on an eight half by 11, I started to break it up. And be, you know, <laughs> different components, different. And I think that led me to better design. <coughs> Anybody can build a giant, complex model. It takes a lot more to be elegant and have a, a sense of, you know, I don't, I don't want to compare it to Amadeus, but there's a great line where he says, you know, just one note less, it would have been diminished. Right? That's, or there's Einstein, something else, right? He's got some great quote about simplicity. And that's not easy to get to. Or some other great founder of our country, I think, said some line like, this letter would have been shorter, except I didn't have time. Mark Twain. I wanted right. to write you a, a short oh, note, but I didn't have time, so I wrote you a, a long one. The Some Einstein other. quote was, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. Yes, there you go. Usually if people Thank remember you. the first, they forget the second. Yes, because it's too long. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so that's one of the things I want to want to try to do is you know help you understand that Agile is much more state of mind than it is a bunch of steps. And it's much more about um, applying it, like Max said, <coughs> even the weird tie-dye stuff, like applying it to you. Like I hope to goodness that someone writing software that can kill you, right, I don't know, cyber knife software, better not be the same as, I don't know what your startup was, young man, but Flash band. what was it? Flashband. Flashband? Yeah. Whatever that means. <laughs> like musicians. Oh, okay, cool. Like music. All right, yeah. I, I hope you don't take it, you didn't treat it the same way. Like, I hope your agile process wasn't the same, or vice versa, right? I mean, it's really relative. So what, what do you think is the most important aspect to delivering software? What's the one, number one, most critical ingredient to delivering so, a, a software product? People. Damn. <laughs> All right, you cheated. No, you're right. I mean, it, normally, no one comes up with that. Whoops. All right. It sounds. I was watching on YouTube, which is now 30 seconds ahead. There you go. <laughs> now you got me thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Time warp. <clears throat> you would write trading applications. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's funny. I remember getting called into a company to help them with their trading application because the only way they could add another product that they could figure out was to duplicate the code by. They said, I think we need help. Yeah, maybe. So yeah, people, uh, as stupid as I said, well also people is the hardest part of software, right? Work for all the people would be easy. That's the other, you know, kind of dual edged sword. What's the, if you get a bunch of really good people working on a product, what's typically the next thing that might help getting something out the door? People? Teamwork. Teamwork, yeah. Collaboration. Collaboration. Communication. Communication, yeah, those are all really good. That's true. But what do you, when, when people are faced with, you know, typically the application has a lot of things where you do a lot of repetitive stuff, and you know, what do you often end up doing, Jason? Process. Process, right. Oh, I guess I didn't have a good one good fate in there. And then the third thing is tools, and about that or. So, you know, it's really critical to not forget 
And one of your most important ingredients is people wear, like right? that soft stuff. Getting, you know, whether it's the designers, whether it's making sure that the, you know, the development team is not, you know, bisected in a bunch of different types of groups of people that I can do. Well, let's call it DBA you know, because I want to add a new class and it needs to be persistent. Um, people, process, and tools in that order. And the other two, you know, really kind of depend where you stick it based on is it a super rigorous, like, you, you know, some of you might be in a financial industry or some highly regulated industry where, let's face it, you're going to have probably a bigger, a bigger emphasis on process because you have to. But in, in other ways, you, you can really use the three of these things to your advantage. This again, Agile, who here thinks Agile bullets aren't just like common sense, right? Uh, you know, like to me, they're. I think they're irrefutable. I think they're almost as irrefutable as the, the uh, Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. I mean, they're just, they're kind of like these truths are self-evident. They're just silly, goofy bullets that are hard to refute. No, I think we really should do you know, massive documentation before we write any code. Well, some, some people will say that. Uh, yeah. There are people who argue. Yeah, you're probably right. No, not probably. I'm sure you're right. The key here is really about, I know it's hard sometimes to push back, um, but in, in, in many respects, asking what the downstream receiver of that person asking for all sorts of documentation, why, right? It's really trying to get people to engage their brain, not just follow some, some ludicrous dictation. I'm actually running into the opposite challenge several of my teams where they've gone to the shortest possible and they've forgotten the but no shorter part. And they yeah, want to look at that as, I don't need any documentation at all. I know what I'm doing and the person who's testing it knows and that's enough. Well, if they write really good tests, the best tests are serving as a documentation and the code's really awesome and the code coverage is really good and they're kick ass, okay, right? We got but, the first two but not the last one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the point is it's a very holistic process. There is not a lot of um, wiggle room to just go hardcore in one area and, and not balance it out with the other aspects. But really, you know, the, the reasoning about what you're doing is, is, again, it sounds stupidly simple, but really hard to do. How hard is it to think that it's really important if people talk versus sending out specs, and you know, rev marks and you know, all that kind of goofy stuff. Working software, you know, I'll, I'll show you how it looks. We'll test it out. It's rough right now. Although even that's not easy. Not everybody understands partial progress. Oh, doesn't have, doesn't have, the UI's not done. Well, no. But does this part look great? But well, the UI's not done. Okay. How can I so, it's, it's not done? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, we're just trying to get some early feedback. Okay, that's the last time we'll ask you. Right? But sometimes you have to educate them. You know, because people don't understand what we do. And, you know, you might, maybe we don't want to see sausage in the middle of it being made. I don't know. Yes, Actually, sir. even that comment was important because I learned that the hard way. That's how it came agile. I was writing the software to, for immunization of New York City Department of Education, trying to get an inspection on the doctors and possible. Throwing back things, they'll yell at you, but they'll tell you the whole And that's how I got it, because nobody would write it down, nobody would tell me. Yeah. So in six months, I had to go write it exactly the way they want. And that's how we come at it. There you go. Yeah. School of hard knocks. Exactly. Now, I've given up doing contract negotiations for the <laughs> most part. I did it up, my, I did my time in DOD. Oh. As a matter of fact, after I left DOD because they closed the base, and I did go with them, a fellow, a, a, like a former government um, con friend of mine, he went to the uh, Nielsen Rating Company or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and he came to my company, sent my company an RFP, and it looked a lot like what he did when he was in the government. And I was like, uh, no, I'm not going to bid on this. He goes, oh, come on, why not? I said, I'll work with you on it. I'll, I'll do something part way, and we'll do, even if it's time at T and M to understand what it is you think you want, we'll get to a point, and then I can 
fixed price bid it, but no way will I take this giant idea and, and do anything remotely like a fixed price bid because either I'll have to lie, pat it, or do a bad job and lose my shirt. Anyway, I said no. And he tried a few times and I just totally no bid it and never looked back because that's just really hard if someone doesn't want, you know, if someone thinks that every, everything in this giant spec is going to be perfect, they'll never change their mind, and we'll never <coughs> discover anything while we're building it, and there's no feedback that could possibly, you know, make an improvement. That's just, that's not been my experience in developing software. Maybe others. And of course, the responding to change, that's the whole, you know, agile thing. I have interesting battles with the, uh, I'm working with some friends of mine um, on this one project. And they, I tend to run things in a much more Kanban-like style. Just, to me, software is a to-do list. You got six things to do in this priority order, just go do it. Yeah, I'm sorry it doesn't get, it gets a little more complicated than that, but not much. And the only reason it gets more, you know, so I make it a little more complicated because I got young guys, I got a new, a total newbie. So I might give him some stuff that's actually a little further down on the stack that I don't really need to deliver, but it's easier. He can start working on it. And, you know, so I do really different things that have nothing to do with, you know, with having a, a no, nothing but crack team and just cl climbing through it. But in general, software is about delivering things in the right priority. Why do I need anything else that, more than that? Why do I need sprints? Why do I need, right? I mean, but I haven't really, I have a lot of trouble getting that through even to friends of mine that I'm working with. That doesn't sit well. They, don't, they still want to see some, you know, even though I have roadmaps and I have broad brush things that are in the future that we're going to be working on, they're going to be flowing into, you know, it's, it's how do you get that fuzziness into crystal clarity right before someone starts developing it? You know, so it's blending all that. Um, is, is how I tend to do it, but other folks tend to want a little more planning than, than I feel is necessary. So I do it. But, and, and you know, you may have to deal with even higher levels of planning. So my tip is to do as little as possible to make them go away. Okay, you want six months of plans? All right, so do it just really, like, like don't care about it. That's my, my advice, don't. Don't just think it's got to be right. Just do whatever it takes to get them off your back. And then, because the only thing that counts is what you're doing now. Yes. Right? The only, thing, the only thing that really matters is, is it, is it in jeer? Is somebody working on it? All the rest is just ceremony. Or, so that's my mode of just make people go away by giving them what they want as cheaply as possible. And okay. And maybe someday they'll figure it out, but usually not. So, I didn't tell you that, though. Yes? So, one of the uh, concerns that I've experienced with Agile, and you know, I think based on what you're saying, I, I want to pose this question to you. How do you make a business case to get a software project uh, funded if you can't basically uh, paint a picture for a customer and tell them that it is more than the cost? Uh, how do you finance the problem? Oh. Yes, so uh, the question has to do with how do you get a project scoped, funded, priced, etc. Yeah, that's a different question. Um, I was actually approaching it a little bit from the point of view of, of a company that constantly is building software products as, as a business and they're constantly enhancing, improving, building new stuff. You got a bunch of employees, you know, a little bit of you wonder what it's going to cost. So it's, it's, a little, it's a little different than if I'm actually being posed a question by, a, say, a customer that says, hey, what would it take to build this? Oh, okay, so that, that's a little bit different. I would approach that with, um, the way I like to think about it um, is, first off, what we do for a living is risk mitigation. So I would look at what the request is, how complicated is it, are there any really scary things? We would have, you know, a, I have a spectrum of responses. If it's really simple, something I've done kind of a lot like before, I'd probably say, man, it looks like it's a two month with five guys or girls, five people, right? I, I, I might be able to do that because it's something I've seen before and it doesn't scare me. Other things might be so scary that I say, you know what? 
And sometimes I do this, um, you know, where I'm at right now. When I've got to integrate with something else, I'll say I've got to do some test drilling. And I think I got that from some funny book by, I don't know, Lister or some, some guy. Um, that it was a great analogy. That somebody wanted a, an in-ground pool in their backyard. So they went and got three people to bid. First guy comes, and they had it all staked out, you know, all this crazy kidney-shaped thing, and we want this gazebo, this beautiful pool, um, money pit. And so, you know, they got a bid from this person. The next guy comes, looks it over, gives him a bid as well, a few days later. Third guy comes, not nearly as polished, kind of grizzled old, you know, his fingers are all gnarled. Um, not, obviously not a real sales guy. And he goes, nah, can't bid on it. What do you mean? See that, those pile of rocks over there that are coming out of your neighbor's ground? How do you know they're not here? Well, I don't. Tell you what, I'll test drill and I'll see if there's any rocks. And we'll adjust the bid based on what we find. And if there's no rocks, then we start digging and it'll just be part of the cost. And the moral to that story is if there are hidden rocks under the surface of that project and you don't go test drill and you give them a low bid, then you're going to lose your shirt. So the idea there is when you sense there's a, a bigger risk that you need to investigate, then you need to engage the customer in, look, I'd love to do this job for you. Maybe we do a little time and material or maybe, you know, because you got to put a little skin in the game. I'm not going to do this all on my own because it's for you. And, you're, and so that's the way that I, I try to convince people that I have to do a little part of it first to give me a sense for what we're up against. And then sometimes, you know, you, you even um, engage them in sort of a starting it and doing the riskiest things first under, under payment. And at some point you can say, hey, yeah, once we get a feel for it, we can fix price it if that helps. Or we'll do this to give you a, an estimate. Maybe you can't afford it after all, but at least. So that's how I handle it. Does that make sense? So it's not, it's not easy to just sit there with some document. That's right. But that get, we get into trouble with our big government contracts, especially like the department, state department, which is run by PMOs, uh, people who are PMO specialists. Yeah, so when I, when I cut my teeth in doing DOD and I fashioned my ideas about how not to do software development that way, it was because of that. I was like, yeah. well, how, how are we supposed to do research and development on stuff that we're not even sure what we're doing and fixed price bid. So after a while, I just said, all right, we're just going to do like time box, delivery order. You know, I mean, it's just, right, here's the hours. We're going to work this much and we're going to go do the most important thing and try to give you some feedback. And I'm not going to get all hung up about the fine letters. Easy for me to say because they were like delivery order style contracts. But I've worked with a good rapport with my customers, developed that so that even the government customers understood what, that we're jointly trying to do the best we can with the money we got. And they didn't hold me over, the, you know, rake me over the coals because you know, we didn't get to the, the 67th paragraph on some stupid spec that somebody wrote two years ago that has no bearing. So yeah, that's a real tough business to be in. Which is why there needed to be that thing that government 2.0 that never happened, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, one of the things that I, I like to preach is um, the software constellation. I don't even know what to call it. It's a very holistic practice, right? You can't just do one chunk of it really well and not the other chunks. Like that lotus? Pretty awesome. <laughs> These are all my photos, by the way. Nice. Um, the, the hard part, I think, about doing software is under, and that maybe that's why an engineer, I think all people should have engineering degrees, by the way, just saying. <laughs> like, so that you won't fall for junk science that's in the common vernacular. You'd actually be able to think about how systems work, and like, how do you know windmills are a good idea? <laughs> Where's that, who's, you're stealing that energy, anyway. 
Um, I'll let that linger for a while. <laughs> but the idea about this, what we do is very system oriented, and a lot of people can't think like systems. Mm -hmm. But there's even a system <coughs> of development. You know, all these different pieces have to play together. And I think it's important to know that there's a lot of synergy between the different elements if you do it right. <coughs> and to your right, you're, you're, you're even calling out, like, well, wait, I don't think there should be different teams. You know, or like, why is there this, you know, some upstream process? And sometimes at a certain, and the point is, it's all degrees, right? So a little bit of upstream processes might be necessary. That's how I do it. I do a little bit of design, a little bit of architecting, a little bit of UX. Because a lot of times that saves a lot of words. It makes it easier for me to write an issue to go build this feature and go look at the wiki for this domain model and look at the mockup. And then, you know, go, you know, write some cucumber. I'll even put, sometimes I'll, I'll dummy up cucumber tests or I'll work with the developers to build cucumber tests. And all these things all help with a lot less words point to, you know, you'll know you're done when you do this kind of thing. And here's the model, here's the UI. It's very holistic. It's not a bunch of separate silos trying to somehow weave it together. And Agile is simple, but it's also really hard, right? I mean, it's simple because there's just a few things you have to think about. There's bullets, they're not too many. There's above 12 principles maybe, but it's actually, I find it really hard. I fall down on it a lot. I often am in, a, in, in my daily stand-up, especially because I have some remote people and sometimes I gab a little bit more. I want to make sure that the team really understands this one vision. And I often will say, oh, the scrum gods are going to strike me down because I'm not following some <coughs> proper practice. Because I'm going to way more detail than most scrum teams probably do, but I don't care. <coughs> I think it's important, and it's about repetition. It's about making sure the team, I like to make sure the team knows where to go when I'm not around. I've worked myself out of the job. I want the team to be able to be on their own. I want them to be able to make their own decisions because I planted the flag in the distance, and they're smart people, and they too can get there without me having to tell them every step of the way. So that's my approach, and I think it is a little bit harder. Can I ask a question? Yes, you may. So at some point, do you really need, once you have a self-organized system, do you need a Scrum Master? At some point, do you really need it? When yeah. it's really self-organized? A Scrum Master. Yeah. Do you really need a Scrum Master? Do you master? really need a Scrum Master? At some point. And like, at some point. Like, two years or something, that it's seems really performing. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And where's the DC Scrum people? <laughs> 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 And by the way, is this crooked or what? It's horribly crooked. The way DD moment, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this like, do you need project managers? I've worked with some killer project managers that are awesome to work with. Um, I don't use them or haven't worked with them on delivering a two-week sprint. Right. Or, not that, but coordinating all the other garbage that might have to be coordinated in a large system or with a big company or stuff like that. Um, I've never, have I worked with a Scrum Master? <laughs> kind of funny for me to ask that, isn't it? Um, I don't know. Do you need a Scrum Master? Because the, the, it depends probably on the skill level of the team and maybe how it's directed and Maybe that's kind of where you're coming from. Like to a certain point, once you get that boat pointed in the right direction and give it a shove, can it kind of keep going? Can't the team be organized enough? I would guess a scrum proponent would say, well, yeah, maybe, but our role is to help deal with roadblocks, problems, the rest of the organization, just crap that the team shouldn't have to deal with. Um, so it probably depends on the culture. Like we. I don't have them on my team, unless I'm it. I don't know, maybe I am, I don't even know. Maybe you are. Maybe I am. Um, I'm kind of the vision, the architect, yeah. the scrum master on the bottle walk, washer, and, um, and I cook. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I don't put myself on a critical path. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really fascinating question. And that's a, 
actually the right mindset <coughs> is to question, right? I mean, like at, at the at uh, Cleveland, I was working with my lean dog buddies. They're on a boat, but we were working with a with a paint manufacturer to build a new product. Well, they're matrixed organization, so they were they were sure to load us up with the right kinds of people, like a DBA and a this and a that, a UI guy, a DBA guy. Um, they had <coughs> DevOps sort of people that came in later. First thing is we moved them to the factory from out of the office high rise in downtown Cleveland. We moved them to the factory, so that was really it. No more driving downtown to the fancy factory. I mean, to the fancy office, you're coming down to this. Must have Sherman Williams. It is. Uncle Sherman bought it. I was living with that fight. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that, yeah, it was great. It was awesome. So, early on, so I'm trying to get them this C sharp. I don't know if C sharp or anything. Doesn't matter. But, um, so, I get, them, you know, I get them to finally figure out how to do behavior driven development and, and how to do things like, you know, simple stuff like clear the database before you run all your tests. And, and simple things like, uh, you know, specify your starting, assert your, your givens and whatnot. And, and early on, with hardly anything going on, I mean, we barely started the project, and there's these, like, recipe number 57. I'm like, well, what's that? Oh, well, uh, yeah, we thought it'd be good if we preloaded it with some data. I'm like, no, right? And, and the DBA came in, and they preloaded it with some tables. I'm like, no. Sorry, don't want to like piss you off. But can you just get rid of all that and let's start over? Because they, they they knew, of course, they knew what they were building because they're rebuilding. We were kind of rebuilding a new system, so they knew, and they actually had some old data. And like, like I never want to see, I never want to see tests relying on data in a database. Personally, um, I will make exceptions for really really hard things that are really expensive to make. But in general, if it's, if you're trying to do really agile, simple tests. I don't like tests in the database. So the DBA, you know, we, we had to use this DBA early on. So we want to make a new class. OK, well, let's go get the DBA. I'm like, really? I've been doing, I learned SQL using R base as a kid. And I didn't know I was learning SQL, but it's awesome that I learned real SQL. And I'm like, after a while, this, this is the sweetest guy, such a nice guy. So after you know a couple of meetings where I'm realizing, dude, I don't need you. I've been writing SQL. I don't need you to write create table, boom, add column, boom. Sorry. Um, and and he actually kind of got the gist. So he even said it before I had to say it. He said, so you probably don't really need me here, do you? No. But when I do, I want you, right? I want to use you for what you're good at. I want to use you when we need to optimize it. I want to use you when we actually have a true database problem, not to put a roadblock when I'm trying to build a new feature for a new class in the domain, <coughs> and I gotta wait for some DBA to tell me how to write a freaking SQL script, right? So that was an opportunity for me to reposition this matrix person and set him free, and, and uh, he, he, he didn't mind, so that was really good. But that, again, that's the kind of thing where I think you should always question. You don't have to keep doing something because that's the way you did it. And the same thing with the DevOps people. It took me a while to get them to understand kind of the continuous delivery of the staging service and you know, how, to, how to flow the delivery system through because they, they just were much more matrix. They were really used to these silos of operations you know, with, with no apparent as much care of the downstream or the interaction at the, at the handoff points, kind of like our healthcare system. But anyway. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Sort of, kind of? Probably not really. Any other questions around, do you need a Scrum Master? I, yes, Heather. Oh. Oh, okay. Ladies first. This isn't a question that I'm just thinking when you were talking. People don't notice the absence of pain. Yeah. Because if you don't have pain, that's cool. But got to really pay attention. You start to notice the problem, then maybe you need to make another switch. Like, yeah, it's a good point. You don't notice the absence of pain. Actually, the answer to the question is that it depends. The best answer, actually. Yes. 
right. small team and high high performance teams, one person can be scrum master. Right. Larger teams, not high performance teams, you do. So that's that's how correct. I look at it. Yep, that's why agile is hard because you always got to use your brain. Exactly. It's always in context. It's never one answer fits and, all. Uh, Jeff Sutherland, that's why I was frowning when people call uh, Scrum as a methodology or anything other than a framework. Yes. You have to figure out it. Right. Yes. And that's hard, right? That's exactly. A lot of people don't want to do the hard work. Yeah. And it can't. Yeah, come on. They want to follow just, a recipe. Yeah. yeah. Like you follow yeah, something exactly. simple. That's the biggest challenge. Now, your answer to the Scrum Master kind of question assumes that there's a role that exists yeah. that must be maintained. If and it's just Scrum, do you yeah, need a Scrum, that is a role we and I, I, I thought his question was kind of, can you eliminate that role entirely? Are those things no longer needed? Not particularly Scrum. If you're doing Scrum, you probably need a Scrum Master, just saying. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Here's a different way to think about Agile. So, um, I did, sometimes to, to think about stuff, if you turn it upside down, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting. Um, yeah, I think we even talked about that in the car. I forget, some funny thing that I turned upside down. Now I can't remember it, thanks to ADD and beer. Um, but yeah, imagine about trying to provide the illusion of making progress with software. So what if we wanted to follow dogmatic, like in other words, this is, this is the planet Bizarro, following a dogmatic process and using case tools to, to generate everything over inspiring individuals to actually work with the teams and the clients. Well, that sounds like something we should follow. Thank you. Well, that's fun. Right? Does anybody do that? Oh, yes. <laughs> This would be the executive ideal if you can eliminate all of these annoying developers and yes, just rely upon highly automated tools, then life would be really grand. Yeah, that's very true. Kind of like outsourcing everything to other places. Yeah, yeah outsourcing. Yeah, outsourcing. I used to be cynical, and uh, <laughs> and I got all that right. I used to be cynical and say outsourcing was just a cheaper way to fail. Nice. Um, but no, I mean, the bottom line is working with, with a remote team, that's not going to get any easier. And it's hard enough to work with them when they're in your office. Exactly. Although I will say, sometimes remote teams are, I, I've driven a lot of remote teams, and in some sense, you have to be really a little bit more verbose, a little bit more, um, especially different time zones. Mm -hmm. Like when, when Russia was about eight hours difference. I would go there two weeks a month, but nonetheless, in between, you know, and I actually developed working with remote teams for over a decade or more. I developed fairly, probably more heavyweight than you might think processes, but also they're just enough kind of en enough ways to keep the team moving and rolling without <coughs> being blocked, without having to work worry about being collaborative, and not having a lot of excess conversations around a water cooler. Right, kind of like, like a lot crisper. So it's an interesting thing. But in general, yeah, outsourcing isn't going to be easy. And sometimes people did it just because it was a cheaper per hour cost. But they might not have ended up with anything. And of course, we would, we would want a lot of comprehensive design specs up front. And you know, that's what the because I'm not going to start, start writing code and showing you anything real until I get these big docs. Because that would make sense. And I used to work with lots of statements at work. So it's really fun to negotiate and change and do, do uh, paragraph changes and ripple the changes through the whole, you know, like a chain review board. Anybody work on chain review boards? They're fun. Yeah. They're a lot of fun. Oh, uh, yeah. That's the, kind of my way of doing business because it's somebody else's money. And of course, driving towards the original idea that we had a year ago without fail because it's oh. in, in the contract. I have a good one. What? what? Oh, you got a good story for that? Oh, yeah. The yeah. yes. Department of State was going to uh, follow the uh, driver's license test. The first time we ever did a demo, that person look, looking at it said, it's not going to work. I said, <laughs> well, let's agree that you change the spec and I will fix it. No problem. But uh, that's because we did frequent demos. Otherwise, they would have never discussed. 
That's why your password, by the way. Uh -huh. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, go, go figure that they couldn't actually maybe think of it all perfectly up front and then wait a year for it to emerge all beautiful. It's not, unfortunately, birthing software is not nearly as perfect as birthing humans. <laughs> so anyway, the, the contrast, I think, is a little facetious, admittedly, but the idea is if you, you know, that some people actually think of like the world of Masara. So I guess you get to hopefully decide what's it going to be. So unfortunately, trying to get to the, the better places, it's us. We, we've uh, like posted, we've, we met the enemy and it is us or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because, all right, how many people have, you know, have, have had teams gnash their teeth when you say we're going to start doing Agile? Adam, I know you're trying to transition some place to Agile. I mean, a lot of times that's like, oh. Yeah. Yikes. Here we it's, go again. It's change. Not all of us like change. I like change. Not pocket change. <laughs> it's not worth much anymore. But anyway, you get a lot of, a lot of complaining. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's also not easy to be a craftsman. I try really hard. I'm a better critic than I am a doer, but I try really hard. And every, luckily, the, one of the best guys on our team, just this morning, is, or just like when I'm on the train, is like, sweet, yes. The test, a test was failing on the develop branch, and Bob admitted to it. It's like, oh, that was my fault. He rarely makes mistakes, and, and we make fun. And it's kind of like a, he is a, one of my best developers. I've known him for years. He's down in Tennessee, so he's a remote guy, but I bring him up every once in a while. And he's just one of those, just, I want to be like him. I want to be able to code like him. Like, oh my goodness, he's such an awesome coder. I, I'm, like, I'm, like a kid, I'm talking like Ruby and so on. I'm like a kindergartner compared to him, but I still try. Being a craftsman, that's really hard too. So being agile is hard. Being a craftsman at agile or being a craftsman at writing code, writing tests, writing killer stuff that just works. That's, that's not easy either. Some refrigerator magnets that my uh, ballerina daughter happened to put on there. I liked it as being a professional. Where's Lincoln? He's a professional. Yeah. Um, being a professional is awesome. Where people just do their job, do it well, come in, you can count. And I like the fact style is in there. <laughs> that's also part of it. This is another one, like be really impatient. Don't wait for somebody to come up with that UI design. Just start writing code. Get it done, get things built, be impatient, don't wait for it. Now this is a little homage to my aerospace background, but this is the humorous idea about if you, if you let a given team build a system to their view, it's gonna look really funny. Like the aerodynamicist is going to be like a needle. Nobody can stand up in the, cock, in the, in the fuselage. You know, the, the structures guy is going to be giant eye beams. It's kind of like you let the database guy or the U, UI person or, or anybody else, you know, the, the awesome JavaScript dude. You're going to have JavaScript everywhere. The point is, we got to be balanced, and that's not easy either. And I won't go into a lot of details on here, but and anyone here model-driven architecture? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Anyone here rails? You know, Ruby on rails, that kind of rails? Not, not train tracks, but rails. Rails is the first thing that had the guts to implement in a framework exactly how I've been trying to preach doing development for since 2000. Where the, one of the biggest things is modeling the domain. If you don't understand the business, it doesn't matter how good your database is, it doesn't matter how awesome your UI is, if you miss the business, you you missed the boat. Modeling the domain, the slowest part of your app is going to be the domain, typically, unless there's a lot of regulations and a lot of government gone amok and keep changing the regulations and you're chasing the regulations. But in general, the business domain tends to be the most stable aspect. You know, UIs can come and go out of fad. Your database, you might change that. <coughs> so really, my focus has always been if you don't understand the domain, nothing else matters. And once you understand the domain, Use separation of concerns, model view controller, layered approach. You can put any number of, of 
of architectural principles in there. If you had to pick one to learn, learn separation of concerns. Because that means you're teasing things apart. You're not blurring the lines across the whole app. You're building a really solid component-based architecture. And the funny thing about uh, number two is if I have, this is where model-driven architecture only reason I ask is Rails, for example, wow, I can uh, generate a bunch of, if I have a domain model, like projects have items and items have documents and projects have notes and items have notes. If I have all these classes that I want to basically turn into an application, not that I can do it in Rails, but you can actually generate that in Rails, including the scaffolding and have a stupid basic CRUD app like, because all of the framework, all of the nitty gritty, all of, hey, how do the controllers work? Hey, how does the persistence layer work? Eh, we took care of that. You just, you just model your domain components. Now you still always say, for this, this consistent architecture, and, and this, this happened when I did IBM's manufacturing execution system, my team, it was about 200 or 300 cla domain classes alone, because it was a manufacturing execution system that built IBM's computers, big computers. I was actually scared that they really used our software for that, C++. But I kept telling people, you should be able to hold, you guys remember being able to hold papers up to like a, a the sunshine, you can see you know, papers through each other. I always always say, I want to be able to hold the same kind of code, the data, like a data layer, the data management layer, up against the wall. And all I should see is the fuzzy parts where the domain names change. And that's what model-driven architecture is. That's what, what Rails is. Because all that infrastructure stuff is just the controller might have the same name as the domain model. The database layer might have the same name as the domain model. The idea is, is a lot of what we do in those, in, in those parts of the apps don't have anything to do with making money. So make them go away. And that's what Rails is. That's what model-driven architecture is. That's what number two is. I shouldn't go to different parts of your app and see different opinions on how to do the same kinds of things that aren't associated with <coughs> business. If you want to be creative, be creative in providing business value. Don't be creative in providing yet another way to do a persistence. Right? I don't need that. Don't be creative about another way to to bring something from the database up to the UI. And then do things in a very agile manner. That's number three. And that's a little waterfall picture there. The waterfall is another misapplied and misunderstood process. I, I, for some odd reason, I don't know why, I got to review Walker Royce Jr.'s book on project management. And he had his dad's IEEE paper, which I never read in my life until reviewing the book, on waterfall. And I'm like, Huh, that's cool. But again, I'm not a software guy, so so I read it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it had like feedback, eddy currents in there. It it's not at all like waterfall was, right? I mean, because I used to I'd see people in giant insurance companies, you know, oh, what are you doing? I remember talking to General Walker, at USAA, doing some salt down there, and it's like, yeah, well, this whole team here, they're doing like nine months of use cases. <coughs> okay, <laughs> I mean. I get it, it's probably a gigantic system, and they didn't really know what their original system did, I get it. But it's still funny when you have you know, big consulting firms, what do they do? Well, we're on the phase one of uh, gathering the requirements, and then what do you do? Well, then we give that document to whoever gets the phase two contract, I'm like, oh. Well, all those nuanced conversations will never get passed on, right? I mean, right. it's just a waste to think that you can do waterfall in such gigantic chunks, but you can do it every couple of days or every couple of week, you know, week, right? You can you can do a little bit of that whole cycle. You just do it something less than six months. And be lazy. I love getting stuff done and not doing it the hard way. Just saying. I mean, I, that's there's there's no points in, do, in doing something the hard way. And I guess that's one of our dogs. Or his walking dog. It's, oh, you no, know, we do have, a, I have a Bernese Mountain little dog picture in my wallet. Uh -huh. That's the uh, goofy um, Charles something or other. Spaniel? Yeah, Spaniel. Cool. But be lazy means really trying to get things done quickly and not excessively doing extra work. I mean, it sounds stupid to be lazy, but I like being lazy. And this goes for most of our life. Right, be like, channel that inner fourth grader, or four-year-old, rather. But why, Daddy? And try not to say, because I said so. <laughs> but really ask why, 
are we doing this? Why do we have a scrub master? Or why does it need to be this? And why do we need, why do sprints need to be a month? Why do sprints need to be a week? This is again, I think Peter Cody taught us about five whys in. <laughs> you get the five whys and it's legit. A lot of times you can't get very far into why, so. Again, if you're starting off, you don't have much choice other than just do it. But, like you expressed that you had a, an epiphany, you questioned yeah. something, and you, that turned you into an agilista. Because after you gain enough experience and see enough you know, samples of things happening, just like I did at DOD land, I was like, this ain't right, there's gotta be a better way. You know, I'll do something other than this, this rote process, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sentient, upright you know, carbon unit that can, can, that can actually think for myself and decide whether it's a valuable thing to do. Not, and the other thing is, <coughs> act like an owner, not an hourly wage worker. That's, that's my, it's, I can't even turn it off, it's actually a shame. Because sometimes yeah, I should be like an hourly worker. But I can't turn it off trying to do the right thing as if I was the owner of this business. And like, this is stupid, and I don't think we should do this. I think we're wasting your money. But try to say it better than that, because it <laughs> don't come off too well. <clears throat> Again, you don't do Agile, unless you're at the very learning stages and you can't do anything but that. But you really need to move to, I am being Agile. I have it in my mindset. I'm trying to do the best I can in the context that I've got. Because each, like <coughs> I said, each one of you might be in a completely different context. So you can't just follow some rote process. One of the things I love about doing yoga is it's your practice. There is no, well there's some freaks, okay, that you can see some freaks on YouTube. <laughs> like some guy, yeah, anyway. But in general, I'm not that freak. Um, I have absolutely no flexibility in my hips. But, Yoga is a practice. You do the best you can in the body you got. And it's kind of like Agile. You're right? You do the best you can in the project team you got. And some days are better than others. Some sides are better than others, right? And it's very yoga-like. Not to get all zen, but... So, I think if you reread the Agile <coughs> principles, rethink them every so often. <coughs> you know, they're not bad. I know some people want to repeal them or something like that, but I actually think they're not bad. They actually have a lot of, a lot of essence of, of, you know, to me, that's what we did. We got to the essence of software development, as wishy-washy as those four bullets might seem, and they're wishy-washy on a purpose. Because we didn't want to be dictatorial, we wanted to be inspiring you to think we don't say we hate documentation. We just say don't do that at the expense of not doing any real software because you're not shipping documentation, <coughs> right? So it's it's really I think something to look back at every so often and think if you can turn any of your ills or problems or challenges into improvements. And I really liked how Brian put the fact that this these meetups are all about trying to help each other get better because it's not easy. A lot of people don't understand us. We're like artists. We kind of are, right? We're knowledge workers. We're not, we're not bricklayers. Although I love awesome bricks that you see down in Georgetown and stuff like that. There's probably some pretty well made bricklayers in the same. But um, we are knowledge workers, and it's not easy for us to be understood by those who think somehow this should be magically this easy to figure out how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost, and when it's going to be done yet not be that involved. So it's great that some of you mentioned you had stakeholders involved and can see progress, right? That's a beautiful thing. Try to improve that. But you might not be able to change the world with Agile, but you might be able to change your local group. You might be able to change your team. Who knows, you might be able to get up to uh, my father-in-law. <laughs> you might be able to get up to uh, changing the company. Maybe even the country. Maybe the world. No, probably not. Anyway, so Agile is not a silver bullet. Oh, there's an old title, Agile Shmi Agile. That's if I gave it up to the Yiddish community in New York. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, 
And you forgot to throw a red card, so I don't know if I went too long. No, yeah. Any questions? Yes, sir. Public the the bizarre manifesto by I I should. No, I could. Should. That should I? <laughs> all right. What people ask? I bet that I bet that. All right. Nobody steal that domain name. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one time. All right. I don't know. We're probably out of time. But one time, I uh, somebody wanted me to become a take over. This awesome German guy was a CTO something of like a company that did digital phones, like Vonage or I forget what. So I went, I went there, did a little bit of consulting, a little bit of interviewing. Saw the different teams that were working, they were all AT&T, and they're, they're like 67 layers from where they used to be. And I left that place after a couple days, saying no, but I left that place going, I would sooner grow a team from babies than take over this dysfunctional group of people. And I immediately went home and registered, I don't know if I still have it, I forget, like the Agile Software Institute. I thought, all right, I'm just going to build babies of how to, how to build software. Like, so yeah, that, the bizarre manifesto.com. I can do that. That might be helpful. I might have to hang it in my office. <laughs> That's hilarious. You have to, you have to remind people. Right. <laughs> yeah, which one do you want to follow? Well, what do you want to follow? Real. <laughs> Next. I just had a quick question because uh, not a lot of the manifesto signers talk about what happened in in Snowbird, right? So, what, just quick overview: what was the process that got you to the end result, and and you know, just yeah. how did that how did that work? Um, I believe it was Uncle Bob who started contacting people. So, because of Peter Code being my mentor, that's how I got involved. And he, so he went to different practitioners of different processes. And we started off with Ward's Wiki. So that was cool. Like probably before anyone knew what a wiki was, we were like using some wiki and collaborating and having phone calls and trying to figure out what we wanted to do and trying to understand each other. And then it became hard to understand each other via goofy, tiny sessions like that. And so I said, wow, why don't we just meet face to face and try to talk? Yeah, sure. Sounds good. And more of us wanted to go skiing than wanted like wanted to go to the beach. <laughs> so, so we um, we we ended up picking Snowbird. And it really was. Well, we knew when we were meeting there that yeah, these four bullets are really going to have this wide of an impact. We're, we had absolutely no idea. It was really all about trying to combat what was then a huge. I mean, you may or not remember, but certainly a together soft. You know, Rational was huge, and I love kicking their butt in the market, just, you know, that was pretty awesome. But right, Rational Unified Process was big. They were a large voice filling up stalls of mush, you know, with a large process. And yet a bunch of us had all these little lightweight processes. And before FDD, I had <coughs> my own lightweight processes um, and kind of refined them with Peter. So there were a bunch of us that kind of thought, well, hey, there's another way to do it. You don't all have to be heavyweight. So that was really the, the point, was just to see what you think, how do you do it? What, you know, just, it, it, there was no, I'm not even sure we had an intention to publish anything. Who was the facilitator? Um, <coughs> it might have been a combination of maybe Bob Martin and uh, Martin Fowler. Yeah, I'm trying to think. We all took turns describing what we thought of software development. We um, we expressed things that we felt were important of, of our experiences. Like I said, I really expressed how how I wanted you know I wanted to brush off the illusion of progress. Right, the only thing that meant because Peter Code drilled into my head frequent tangible working results. Right. And, and, uh, that, that, that resonates, so that's why there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there. And yeah, I like documentation, but because of my DOD documentation, I also you know, didn't want to put that up front because that was ridiculous to have to do river rafts full of documentation. So a lot of the stuff, you know, I wanted to, to make sure my experiences came loud and clear that large heavyweight processes were expensive and, and you know, not, not valuable. So we got a lot of things flushed out and whittled it down. 
took a couple days. And then the, the 12 principles are largely to help, you know, we couldn't come to any kind of agreement on certain things like um, length of a sprint or, you know, stuff that probably shouldn't be dictated anyway. We shouldn't, we shouldn't yeah. care. So th there's, there were some differences of opinion. So that tended to flow to the 12 principles where we could be a little more expressive. Alistair could get his way or, <laughs> you know, um, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Any thoughts to do it again? <laughs> we met, we, they paid us to come out. I mean, I, I, I did a little bit of the Agile Alliance, I did a little bit of the Agile early on, and then I kind of, I was like, all right, this is getting taken over by Agile and name only. So I sort of checked out, as, as did many people, except for the Scrum, scrum guys. Um, we met on the 10 year anniversary. We met again, because um, they asked us to, and they paid us to come there. So. <laughs> So that was fun, but we talked about it, but we never did anything. Talk is cheap. What What are some of the regret, though? I mean, giving up so many signatures right now, right? That we always done as an manifesto, right? What are some of the myths that's out there? Some of the myths um, that that has been, I think, it has been construed like it's been beyond what you guys originally thought, right? Well, I mean, like, now people like just jump on the band board and add your hatch. Yeah, I think so. So why, why did I get a little, um, what would it be called? Uh, when you get a little dis, dis, oh, disillusioned. Disheartened. Disillusioned, right. yeah. Uh, as I saw people mistaking two day, a two-day course for turning you into a master and turning you into agile. Um, and companies taking project managers, <coughs> yanking them out of that role and saying, oh, you gotta be a scrum master, go to this course. You know, and, and, and there was this, um, this, it's natural, I think it's crossing the chasm, right? Like together soft experience, and early on, killer type, leading edge, entrepreneurial people, ah, this is awesome software, hey, woo. Then you get, pretty soon we're selling into bigger companies and like, what do you mean you don't want new software every three months? It's awesome, it's like Christmas. <laughs> oh, we gotta like train our developers. Oh, like, what? They, they can pick it up, oh, that, right? I learned that, that um, you know, sometimes when you cross the chasm, you're into not the early adopters. You're into, you know, maybe you can pass over into the, I don't know what the next phases are of that famous book, but you know, like a group of people that actually don't get it. I even went, I remember one time, um, yeah, you know, I don't think, you're not qualified to have together, so you know, let me take that from you. I, sometimes I want to do that, it's like, no, you're not allowed to do this. You can't, but that's what I think is one of, one of I won't say it's a regret, but that's one of the things that, that I felt happened to the name. It was agile in name only. People were just like going through some motions, saying they're agile, using it as a stick. Hey, we're not doing documentation. Look, or, right? I mean, you just get all these goofy ideas about yeah. what it is, not being holistic, not treating it as it's an actually very hard thing to do well, and instead just using it as a bludgeon to their boss or something like that. Oh, look, it's in the manifesto. If you twist it a little bit. So yeah, we'll publish that or bizarro manifesto. So you know, that's yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. That would be helpful. Yes, Matt. One of the things, how, how many of you, how many of you can off, off the top of your head state the values of the in, in the four values in the Agile Manifesto? Okay. How many are close or no, kind of know what they are? Okay. All right. How many of you know what the last sentence of the manifesto says? Okay. Anybody want to take take a shot? We are uncovering new and oh sorry. Hmm? Something along the lines of we're covering new and different ways. We haven't figured it that out. That was first. Oh, okay. Because nobody the ever reads time. the last last paragraph or last sentence of any document. I don't care how short it is. Okay. It says while we value the things on the right, documentation, contracts, process, all that stuff, we value the other stuff on you know the stuff on the left more. Why? Because when we focus on communication, which three of the four values talk about, and we focus on delivery and adaptation, which the fourth one talks about, we focus on those three things, guess what? We have better results. Duh. When we talk, about, when we talk to our customers, we talk to our teammates, we talk to each other, 
we adapt when there's, when there's a necessity to, and we find out about it because we're talking to our environment, we're talking to our customers, we're talking to all those people, et cetera. You know, we have better success. And we so make sure you memorize those four bullets. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or at least the last sentence. Yeah, the last <laughs> sentence. Yes. Have you run into situations where success has not bought you the praise you thought or expected? Or success has not brought. It's not brought uh, fame joy. and fortune? Yeah, fame and fortune. Joy. You mean for the agile thing? We yeah. picked him up oh. in a Lamborghini. I don't know what you're talking about. No, 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 no. <laughs> I drive a 15 year old car. So. No, no. no. I have there been, uh, may not be your end user, but some middle manager who was not happy because you delivered or you did forgot something else. Oh, you're talking about in my personal? Yeah, have, have I ever, ever screwed up? No, um, not screwed up. I think you mean, Sanjay, uh, Sanjay uh, oh. if you deliver, like a you team deliver. is delivering something and then now you're like, wow, this sh person should be happy and yeah. I should now have some clout or some say of like, yeah. when I say something, yeah, yeah. they should probably follow it along those lines? Or? No, no, you deliver the project. You actually, what you didn't necessarily check the boxes, get all the permissions you're supposed to, and uh, didn't drag the project along six months. Um, I mean, this, if you ask me, you know, that has been my biggest disappointment. Results has not necessarily. Pick better projects. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't think pick, we can't pick up parents, we can't pick up projects. Right. That's the problem. Yeah, no, you can't choose your relatives. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've yeah. built some stuff that didn't see the light of day, and then some other competitor came up. No, but the reason I the example I gave you, which uh, won a lot of praise, because I get delivered, delighted the people who are going to use it, the passport people. But the managers who are in the middle, I think they were furious. Yeah, I mean, that's a weird, that's a really hard thing to deal with. Yeah, that's yeah. Again, software would be easy if it weren't for all people, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's unfortunate that, that you don't know what necessarily motivates them. You don't know, you know, were they the customer? No, yeah. oh, I guess you were the customer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry all you end users who like it. What did you want us to do? Right? I, I exactly. Yeah, it's, um, yeah that's got to be frustrating. Yeah. yeah. I'm so, really well. yeah, I, I, don't, I think I try to avoid. Yeah. Yeah, I don't envy some of that. Thank you. Chair, you had a question? Yeah, I was just curious, uh, when you started the presentation, you talked about scaling agile and how hard it is. I was curious, in your experiences, what has been the biggest challenge you have faced in scaling agile? So what has been the biggest challenge I have faced scaling agile? Hmm. I'm trying to think of... I've probably assiduously avoided large teams. I'm trying to think of what the largest team I might have ever been on. Because I always said, when I would see people talk about 100 person teams, I'd go like, nah, I would just make my head explode. Mm -hmm. only, you know, if you gave me 100, 100 people, only way I can figure out what to do with that is I better have a giant enough project that I can do some really large components and talk about interfaces, get it designed to a level of interfaces, and then make, 100 people into five teams of 20 or 20 teams of five. I have not walked in your shoes. I have not tried to scale Agile to 100 because it just makes it, that sounds hard. Like I just don't know, that would be my approach. I've never had to do it. I've only, I've probably only worked on, together soft we might have had 60 developers, but that, that was different. I actually had really awesome folks, so I, won't, I wouldn't call that, um, that would be good. I, I would say the teams that I've generally worked with are 20 maybe. So, yeah, uh, what size teams have you had to work with? Or? The teams are all small. It's just the, the communication aspect that you were emphasizing when you start to have a collection of such teams. That's when some of the challenges start to appear. So I'm just curious from that from your experience. Yeah, the way, the way that I, you know, I, I think the way that I handle 
any given project is really to break it up into domain-based layers. So um, there's usually natural boundaries in which you can break things up and, and apply things more, almost more recursively. But it takes a little bit, that takes a little upfront work. There, the, the, the IBM uh, manufacturing execution system, I think by rights an MES system is seven major modules. This was back in 1995 and 1998, 10 years of my life. Um, you do the math. There was a case where the actual contractor was somebody who already developed a relationship with IBM. But luckily, I was sitting on an airplane and between two guys, and I, I was able to wedge my way and help convince IBM we could get this object-oriented rewrite done of their code. So my, my five people were embedded in this larger organization who actually had the contract. And they probably, on more than one occasion, kept saying, you know, we, we got this room full of con outside contractors that we're bringing in, like H-1B visa types. And I was like, well, we're not ready. What do you mean? Well, they're coming in like on Monday. I said, well, I don't care. I'm not using them. I, I, and in terms of scaling, that was my defense mechanism. I'm not ready. I don't have enough of the, the big chunks of the system designed out yet. Speaking of design, you know, but, but so it was, it, we had like a SWAT team where I was still doing the, the couple hundred, you know, high level objects models. And we were doing basically the architecture to build what they wanted. They wanted this crazy, I won't explain it, but this, this crazy application to run in these multiple ways. So, so we were still building out the architecture. I wasn't ready to have 20 people at a keyboard starting to da -da 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 and running havoc. So my technique for scaling was give me a chance to build the system components that I know I need to get done. Then we can start tackling each one. Then you can bring the teams on. So I would think that's how if I were faced with a project larger than that, I would just do that approach. 